You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are watching, listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today's 8 18 21. Our good friend is back with us, Mish Schneider. And uh, we're going to be talking about the markets, Palantir's acquisition of gold. Does it matter to the gold markets, cryptos, the real economy, and a lot more? And if you got a question, I suggest you send me an email to kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, Mish, it's great to have you back on. We saw a little uh, dive in the Dow yesterday, but now perhaps the market is rebounding. It's uh, hopefully, well, the Dow's down nominally, S&P down nominally, but NASDAQ is up. What is going on with these markets? Well, there's really so divided camps right now, of a bullish case and a bearish case. And yet, if you look at the market over the last month, considering I just came back from a three week vacation to find NASDAQ basically trading exactly where it was when I left, IWM slightly lower, but now sort of back at the bottom of the range. That's the Russells, the SPY and the diamonds making new highs, but now back within that range. This type of a range bound market could, of course, resolve either way, depending on what side of the equation you want to look at. And of course, we always know that the Federal Reserve is there to sort of support things, as the case of yesterday with the Dow down at one point close to 400, Powell came out and talked about the Delta variant and how the Fed would continue to do whatever they needed to do to make sure that the markets, well, he wouldn't say markets, but that the economy does not falter as a result. And of course, we know that translates to let's buy stocks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know, the bears have some legitimate concerns. I would say not necessarily the Delta variant as much, because even though we are seeing five states now with mask mandates, including New Mexico, where I live, um, we're not seeing any shutdowns of businesses. There could be maybe more pressure in terms of proving that you're vaccinated. Um, but all of these things really without getting into the weeds about whether we agree with that or not, how that impacts the market is what I'm interested in. And it seems to me that the market is dismissing really the Delta variant. It's more a concern of the Fed. And the reason why they're dismissing it is because it's a concern of the Fed. The sentiment is, is that even though retail sales went down and consumer sentiment fell a little and some of the housing starts fell a little, that the overall writing theme here is that the Fed is going to continue to be dovish. They're going to continue to support with bond buying, even though they're threatening a taper. And until that actually happens, party on. All right. Let the good times roll. Party like right. it's 1999, as the <laughs> song said. But right. uh, but look like so the real economy everything is down basically and in the summer with all the stimulus we had it should be going up but we're also looking at uh, a lot of people losing their stimmies imminently within a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and we've seen in states that cut their emergency unemployment benefits cut them off in july and late june that their uh, their rate of uh, unemployment uh, of of additions to the workforce went way, way up. And the ones that uh, didn't cut it have seen basically stagnation. So with the imminent end of these stimmies, are we going to see a major uh, rebound in hiring around the country? I'd say yes, we'll see a rebound. But there's also surveys that are existing right now that say that a lot of people will not go back to work regardless, or at least they'll change the way they work. If they cannot work from home, 
companies like Apple, for example, which want you to not only prove vaccination, but are going to COVID test you like a couple of times a week, could turn off a lot of people from returning to work. And so what will they do instead? Of course, that's the big question. But there has been a lot of innovation in terms of what people do when they stay at home. And so investing is another key area that people experienced over the course of COVID with their stims stimmies, as you say, and did very, very well. So there's also this kind of aura around the market as the great hope for keeping you solvent, not to mention cryptocurrency, which I know is something you want to talk about. So I, it's going to be hard to say whether or not this sustains. I mean, I remember you and I talked about the, the infrastructure package as possibly the thing that's going to make the economy grow beyond the back to normal, whatever normal means. And yet it was passed. It's taken a back seat right now because we have obviously other concerns happening geopolitically. Um, but nonetheless, it was passed and maybe not big enough, but at least it was something. So it'll be a very interesting September once all of these things come to play. Yeah, well, September, October, always dangerous months for the stock market, Mish. So hey, going back to something you said, so uh the big banks are the one exception they want their employees back in the office the mm -hmm. tech companies seem to be uh, real happy with remote working but the banks themselves from what i've read I, I, there's been articles uh, they're insisting their employees come back to the office so a lot of you out there aren't going to have any choice but to go back right or find something else to do and there is, if you do want to find some other kind of work, as we know, people are hiring everywhere with perks. Mm. All of that's still going on. Incentives to get you to work. The, the, the labor shortage is still very much a factor, particularly in the hospitality area, restaurants, hotels. And so that also will be interesting. And then there's one other thing floating around that, it's still being talked about, but again, it's sort of taken a back burner a little bit here, and that's inflation. Oh, yes. This, the, the, the supply chain disruption is real, and it's affecting everything. I was just in Las Vegas, and as I was going around sort of window shopping and we bought a few things, I talked to a lot of the store merchants about that, and their inventory is low. And so if they don't have, let's say you're buying a pair of shoes your size, they're not saying, oh, well, I'll order it and you'll get it or let me call another store. They're saying, sorry, that's it. We don't know when we're going to get these again. So it's it's and that's just in the retail end. If we step back and look at the raw materials, sugar, I always like to look at sugar. That's been my barometer for inflation ever since I observed it in the early 70s, mid 70s, into the late 70s as the lead indicator before gold and silver and a lot of other commodities went crazy and we went into hyperinflation. And here we are with so many comparables, including, if you will, Afghan and Vietnam in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many comparables to the 70s. And let's just go back to sugar. Sugar was the first commodity to go from basically six to eight cents a pound to up to 66 cents a pound. Last year, it was at eight or nine cents a pound. It's now trading over 20 cents a pound. So when you look at that, if there is going to be a super cycle of commodities, which I still firmly believe there will be because of many factors, not just supply chain, weather, water. Do you know you I'm sure you must have read that oh, yeah. uh, Lake Mead now, the federal regulation to cut back water because of a water shortage because of drought. And uh, I mean, this is scary. I live in the in the Southwest. You don't want to hear that in the desert, that there could be water shortages on top of the droughts that we've had. All of this to me means that inflation is something that people should not forget about. And that impact on the market could be maybe the most significant more than anything. Well, you know what Will Rogers used to say, invest in inflation. It's the only thing going up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, obviously you print up trillions in currency units, you shut down the global economy. So you're doing the two things that really make 
prices we're talking about prices inflation is has different definitions but rise in consumer prices so you cut down on production and you increase demand by putting a lot of currency units in everybody's hands and their bank accounts and of course you're going to get supply chain disruptions look i was uh, looking to buy a new microwave oven and if it's one thing we as Americans always had the right, I think I saw it as a constitutional amendment, was <laughs> that if you want an appliance, you can go out and buy it and have it the next day. And what I'm finding is that they're out of stock on everything, and mm -hmm. it's taking them a month to deliver and get it installed. And same with new cars, that's off the chain, all these things. So all these unintended consequences of the lockdowns. One thing I wanted to mention about the lockdowns, the two biggest proponents, the most draconian uh, implementers of lockdowns are both in trouble or on their way out to out or on their way out to Killer Cuomo, he's gone. And, uh, and Gavin, uh, uh, yeah. nuisance, Gavin nuisance. He's <laughs> on his way out as well. It looks like he might, uh, he might be. So that's going to put a real resistance to even the most aggressive, most, uh, authoritarian, uh, governors out there wanting to, uh, implement, uh, these lockdowns again, because, uh, they see at least part of what these two have gone through has to do with lockdowns and, uh, and the result of, uh, COVID. Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Arcana Corporation is on the verge of bringing the world's highest grade silver mine into production. The Revenue Virginius Mine in Colorado has proven improbable silver reserves grading nearly 37 ounces per ton silver with an all-in sustaining production cost of only US $8 per ounce of silver. The mine is fully permitted with infrastructure already in place and the company has announced they plan to commence production in 2020. Achieving successful production usually results in a significant upward share price re-rating on the Lasan curve. Arcana trades under the ticker AUN in Toronto and AUNFF in New York. To learn more, go to arcana.com. That's A U R C A N A.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. I don't believe that we're going to have any other lockdowns. I really don't. I think that we have enough now as far as at least some comfort behind a vaccine, which of course we know is not FDA approved and was rushed out, but it's still statistically is showing that it increases your chances of not getting sick, even with the variants. And of course, you know, the mask mandates, which um, before we started recording, we talked about in Vegas, where you have to have in all of the state of Nevada a mask on. 95% of the people are wearing masks because most people just don't want to get into trouble and they don't want to push the envelope and they just yeah. want to make sure that they take care of their families. But let's get back to the inflation thing, because another yes. thing that's going on is with shipping. There is such a, uh, a, a block in terms of shipping, the cost yes. of shipping everything has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's every factor involved here uh, as far as pointing to inflation. You mentioned, obviously, free money, all the printing, uh, all the debt going around, the, the extremely low interest rates. I think yields were like at 1.27% when I woke up this morning. Um, even though the dollar has come off its, its lows, it's still really down from a year ago. People sort of lose perspective on that. Then, of course, like we talked about, you have Production before COVID was already down because a lot of the prices of commodities were so cheap, there was cutbacks to kind of get the prices up. Then COVID hit the perfect storm. Demand went up. Hoarding is going on, the supply chain disruption. And then you've got good old Mother Nature wreaking havoc everywhere, which is another big factor. So... These inflationary indicators right here, if we think about it and we look at the lessons of the late 70s into the early 80s, assuming that the Fed will have to raise at some point, although I don't know if we're ever going to go back up to those crazy rates we had in the 80s. But um, what happens in the economy is what I see here is not necessarily a recession, but 
a stagnation. We're already starting to see that even with infrastructure. And if that happens, we're going into stagflation and that will be a very difficult situation for whomever's at the helm, uh, regardless of whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, uh, whether it's Powell or anybody else at the Fed, it's a tough situation to deal with. Hey, Mish, so we, we, you and I both remember the 70s. A lot of you out there don't. But in the 70s, what stocks did best during the 70s and, uh, and early 80s? You know, I was so focused on commodities then, I didn't even trade stocks. The S&P 500 was, the Dow was like at 300. So, I mean, you had, you, you were coming out of the nifty 50s, and right. so those all went away. And then I guess you had sort of dividend paying stocks probably is the best, but you probably can tell me more than I can tell I you. I don't remember. I was asking because uh, out of <laughs> ignorance, but... No, I was point. all about commodities back then. I, I didn't even care about the stock market. <laughs> I didn't start even thinking about the stock market until 1982 that when I thought. That's good timing. Yeah. I said, the, I, in fact, I, I went to the guy I was working with. We, he was a gold and silver trader, as was I. And then I moved over to crude oil. But um, he, I said to him, you know, I think we should buy the S&P 500. It looks like it may have bottomed here. Man, <laughs> it sure did. So, uh that's yeah. when it's good to be a trader. So, yeah. but one thing like you could easily liken the FANG to the Nifty 50 or tech to the Nifty 50. If you don't remember the Nifty 50, these were so called one decision stocks like Xerox, IBM, Gulf and Western, Gulf and Western right? was the biggie, yeah. ITT, and you could buy them and hold them for life and they would like pay for your retirement and you could retire wealthy. And that, that's kind of what uh, the FANG stocks and the uh, NASDAQ 100 have really turned into the nifty 50 of our day. Except that the nifty 50, those conglomerates were broken up and Gulf and Western actually went away. And right. what's comparable is what's going on in China right now, because China is trying to solve these antitrust issues by regulating these big companies like Tencent and Alibaba so that they are not monopolizing other smaller businesses. And they just put all these regulations onto them about what they cannot do to prevent them from really being this huge monopoly like we saw in the nifty 50s. And of course, in China, they can easily do that because it's a state run capitalist society here with the threats of doing it to Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon. Who knows if it'll ever happen? But again, lesson from history, we shouldn't necessarily rest on those laurels because the nifty 50 did actually put an end to a lot of those conglomerates and those things went way down. And the stock market stagnated from 1969 to 1982, exactly, it went I remember. nowhere, right? So, so when I got involved in the business in the in the late, I got involved like right around 1980. But I studied what happened in the 70s. That's why commodities trading was the hot, hot, hot thing. And we have a political standpoint. Commodities are still so undervalued compared to equities. One would think, with all the factors that we just talked about, that that commodity super cycle is real. Yep. No doubt. And uh, hey, we'll see if history repeats itself. Hey, one, uh, one last thing about cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, Bitcoin has retraced 50% of its loss uh, during that crash. Uh, that's kind of a danger point. Are you a buyer or are you a seller of uh, cryptos at this point? Well, we were a buyer, but down in the 30,000 area. <clears throat> Once it cleared over 34,000, that's what I was waiting for, because it was ranging between 30 and 34, and then mm -hmm. it took out that 34. And then I went away, and I didn't even check, by the way, the markets. I wanted a real clean break so I could come back with a yeah. fresh perspective. So I was delighted to see it at 46. So now we're at a new range here between 44 and 46. It's gotten quiet. The volume was light. So even some of the Typical crypto bulls are saying, oh, volumes like this isn't a real rally, but I don't see it that way. I still see a lot of whale buying. I think this is a good level now for it to substantiate and develop a new base from. And of course, then we'll be looking at 50,000 and we'll see what happens from there. 
Could it dip to 40? Yeah, but I think that would be a great buy opportunity. Mm. Ethereum is still hanging tough. And then there's some of these other altcoins now that are sort of taking the center stage. One being Solano, which is basically a blockchain special project technology. It's like blockchain and Polkadot are ninth and 10th in terms of cap. Uh, market cap in the crypto space. And, uh, and and actually Solana made a new all-time high today. So you look at Bitcoin, you look at Ethereum as grandma and grandpa, but the whole space in general is just going to continue to be exciting. There's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. All right. Well, there could be some bumps along the way. Of Don't course. Forget. We've had uh, seven crashes. Um, we've had seven crashes in uh, Bitcoin. And we don't know if this one's over yet or not. And it seems to, at this point anyway, lead the cryptocurrency space because it's hard for the other cryptos to be getting any traction if Bitcoin is uh, crashing. So no doubt. interesting to see. Hey, Mish, where do we find you again on the web? How do we connect with you? On Twitter at Market Minute. Uh, if you go to our website, marketgage.com, all of the content that we have that's free and also for our paid members is there. And there's a little tab when you first go to the homepage called media, and we put up the clips. We have a YouTube channel, Market Gauge YouTube channel of all the interviews that I do, which are substantial. And that's a really good opportunity to hear what stocks we're looking at, what we're in, the overall macro picture, cryptocurrency, et cetera. So um, I welcome you to uh, subscribe to the Market Gauge channel on YouTube. All right. Well, hey, that's great. And if you got a question for Mish, send me an email to kl at kerrylutz.com. Make sure you sign up for a free newsletter. Mish, always enlightening, always a pleasure. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.